praise the Lord, saints. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Hallelujah. So blessed today to see the people of God. Hallelujah. I want you to know today that God is still on the throne. God is still leading your life. God is still blessing you. And I want you to know today that you can trust on him in any situation. Hallelujah. So glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glad to be in the house of the Lord one more time. I'm excited today. Had an opportunity to go to California this week and uh, with the military. And I was able to go to the church and do Bible study and see some of the great people of God. Uh, that goes to Greater Mission Ministries and some of the people in Paso Robles, California. Just want you to know that we love you today and we miss you all. Uh, but I just want you to know that God is still in the blessing business. Hallelujah. He's still looking out for us. Hallelujah. Uh, we're going to continue our series. Uh, we've been talking about 777 Rest Street. Hallelujah. That place where God wants us to go to that we may be able to operate in God's rest, that we may be able to operate in God's peace, how we be able to operate in God's love and not be concerned or worried about the things that's going on in the world, but you know God has you. Well, during this series, we've talked about, we're starting to talk about the five spiritual W's, um, the what, the who, uh, where, when, and why. Hallelujah. We're now talking about the second W, which is who. Who am I? Hallelujah. It's very important to know what you are, and that's why we covered what you are first. But now that you covered, uh, we have covered what you are, you must now think about who you are. There's a phrase that my Sunday school teacher back at Bethel Baptist uh, used to say, Miss Jardine Hammers, Hammers used to always say, uh, you got to know who you are and whose you are. You got to know who you are and whose you are. And on that note, I want to give a special shout out to Pastor uh, Antonio Johnson and his wife, uh, First Lady Tab Johnson, on their eighth anniversary. We just know that God is blessing them. Um, they've been pastoring greater. Uh, they've been pastoring Belleville Baptist Church for eight years now, and we just want to celebrate with them and give them uh, thanks. And looking forward to being with them on next Monday as they celebrate the church anniversary. Hallelujah. God is still good. God is still blessing, and that ministry is still being touched by God, still growing. And I just pray now that God continue to touch the leaders of that ministry, Pastor Johnson and First Lady Tab. And I just know that God is going to continue to bless them. I allow, I pray that they don't lack for anything, but He continually bless them and lift them up in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to. Uh, Psalm 139. Hallelujah. Psalm 139. Glory to your name. Psalm 139. On Thursday night, while you're turning there, on Thursday night, we uh, uh, began to talk about uh, uh, within this series, Who Am I? The Word Made Perfect. God, uh, the God, God wanted me to share with you all that, that he's going to be sharing some things through this series that you may have heard before or you may have heard before and didn't quite operate in that realm. And he said, anytime that you're in a place where you hear something that you've never heard before and your flesh is fighting against your spirit on whether to believe it or not, because that's where the limitations lie, church. Uh, your spirit knows the word. It identifies with the word. When the word is going forth, your spirit identifies with that word. But the battle is the flesh. The flesh is what wants to keep you from getting a clear understanding of what God said. Just like when you got saved. When you got saved, okay, uh, 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 your, your spirit man identified with the word that was going forth. Or God spoke to you. Or God sent someone to speak a word to you. But your spirit identified with it. And then you realized, you came to a realization that I need to be saved. And you, want, and you wouldn't get saved. Uh, God allowed... God allow revelation knowledge to come up through your spirit and to let you know that you need to be saved once you heard the word of God. So God said, anytime during this series that you do not uh, understand something or something that's hard to comprehend, think about this phrase, word made perfect. Word made perfect. Hallelujah. The Bible talks about in the beginning was God. The word was with God and the word was God. Uh, the word is what makes us perfect. Uh, the blood of the lamb cleansed us from all unrighteousness. 
But God created everything through the word. God cannot separate himself from his word. He is his word, and his word is him. Hallelujah. And then there's another verse where the Bible says that God is love. He don't sound like love. He don't, he don't look like love. He don't act like love. He don't taste like love. He is love. So, he, so his word is him, and he is his word, and God is love. So that in turn means that love equals God. Uh, when you remember that, the word makes us perfect. Let's go ahead and read Psalm 139, verses 1 through 3 for now. It says, O Lord, thou hast reached me and known me. Thou knowest my down sitting and my uprising. Thou, thou understandest my thoughts afar off. Thou can pass my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. And for a few moments, I'd like to talk to you from the subject, who am I? You must know who you are and whose you are. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We bless you right now for this appointed time, appointed season. Father God, I deny myself. I pray that the people of God will see all of you and none of me. I pray now, God, that you would touch this vessel, God, that you would touch this soul. Father God, bring a word, God, that will bring deliverance to your people, that will bring uh, clarity to your people, God, that will bring guidance to your people, God, that will lead your people, God, by the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for the word that you're going to deliver unto us. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Who am I? So on Thursday night, just to recap so you'll know what we're flowing into today, uh, uh, when God brought us this phrase, uh, the word made perfect okay god began to show me a few verses in the bible and where he had mentioned and talking about being perfect see in genesis chapter 17 verse 1 it says and when abram was 99 years was 90 years old and nine the lord appeared to abram and said unto him i am the almighty god walk before me and be thou perfect now, when you use this word perfect uh, in the natural realm, we understand that perfect means without blemish. We understand that, that perfect means, you know, no faults, uh, no ruins, uh, no runs. Uh, perfection is related to the world, meaning it does not have a flaw at all. Uh, when you look at a diamond, okay, uh, many, many people look at diamonds through magnifying glasses, but they want to see if there's any fault in that particular diamond. Well, God is telling Abraham, well, Abram, he's telling Abram at the time that, that I want you to walk before me. I am almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. Hallelujah. Uh, first, you must realize that, that you and I are perfect spiritual beings. Okay. We are spirit beings that God has made us to be. We are not a chip off the old block, but we are the block. We are spiritual beings connected with a oneness with God. And because God is perfect, and because he's a spirit being, you are thou perfect because you are a spirit being. What makes you don't what makes you not feel like a perfect being is because you focus on the flesh man more than you focus on the spirit man. If you and I was to pay more attention to the spirit man as opposed to the flesh man, we would have God's perspective on how he views us. God views you from a spiritual being, not from a fleshly being. God already understands that no good thing comes from the flesh. So he understands the flesh realm, that no good things come from the flesh. That's why you when you were created in his own image back in Genesis, you were a spirit being, a, a, another speaking spirit, a spirit being. And God understands that spirit that you are to be perfect. Uh, it's very important to know that God views you as perfect because the way you see yourself is the way you're going to carry yourself. If you see yourself as a sinful individual, uh, that has no connection to God, you will walk in that light. But if you consider yourself that you have been made perfect by the word of God, that you've been made perfect by God's word, and you have been cleansed by the blood of the lamb, by accepting the lamb, 
uh, uh, then you will understand that I am a perfect being walking in an imperfect flesh. Now, if I'm a perfect being walking in an imperfect flesh, okay, if the truth be told, uh, the spirit is who I need to be focusing on. But if I'm focusing on the outside, okay, and neglecting the inside, well, I'm going to start taking on traits of the outside or the flesh, if you will. And now I find myself sinning more than living out the word of God. But when we focus on the spirit man more than we do the flesh man, the flesh man will come under subjection to the spirit man and begin to do what the spirit man wants the flesh to do. See, the flesh man can be controlled by the spirit man when the spirit man is in control and when the spirit man is high. So that's why we want to stay connected with God. But then right here in Genesis chapter 6, verse 9, it says, And there are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man and perfect in his generation, and Noah walked with God. I share with the people on Thursday night, even though God is calling him perfect, God is referring to Noah as a just and a perfect man in, in his generation. Uh, and, and say that he walked with God. But then there's verses in the Bible that talk about how he was drunk and naked in a tent. Well, how can it be perfect if he's living or pre presenting himself in that way? God looks at the spirit being and still understand God knows the heart as well. God knows if you are for him or against him. God knows if you're on his team or not on his team. God knows God is concerned with the inner man while most men are concerned with the outer man. God is concerned with the inner man and God said, Noah walks with me. Noah is just, and he is perfect in his generation. I want you to know the closer you get with God, and the more that you walk with God, more that you then you will start to walk in what the Bible calls this newness of life. When we walk with God, we operate and start to walk in this newness of life where the spirit man is running the show, where the spirit man is in charge. Hallelujah. Then over in Leviticus, uh, this is very important. It says, Leviticus 22, 21, it says, And whosoever offereth unto the Lord accomplish his vow or a free will offering in breeze or sheep, it shall be perfect to accept. They shall be no more blemish therein. They was talking about back in the day, you know, they used to have to sacrifice. They had to do a sacrifice for their sins. Uh, they would have to slay a lamb or slay sheep or slay something that covered their sins. But it, and, they, and God accepted that sat their offering as uh, uh, their cleanliness. God accepted their offering as, as uh, uh, their freedom. God accepted their uh, uh, off, off, uh, uh, offering as, as uh, a replacement for their sins. He accepted the offering in as a replacement for sin, or it covered the sins that they had committed. But this reminds me of the perfect lamb that was slain, which is Jesus. When Jesus laid his life on the cross and went to hell on our behalf on the third day, and rose on the third day with all power in his hands, for three days and rose on the third day with all power in his hands, when Jesus did that, okay, God presented him as the perfect lamb. And now your sins are not covered by the blood of the sheep and all the different animals that they use to sacrifice. Your sins has now been removed by the perfect lamb. So, so the animal lamb or the animal sacrifice, if you will, was what God used to cover the sins of man. But when the perfect lamb came, Perfect in, in, in spirit, perfect in flesh. What do I mean by that? Meaning that his flesh, Jesus' flesh was just like you and I. It still was no good. But because Jesus' spirit man was always high, his flesh never got out of line. Or his flesh never failed. Or his flesh was never in charge because his spirit man was always high. So, so Jesus came. 100% man or 100% flesh and 100% spirit at the same time. But because of 
his connection with the Father, because of his relationship with the Father, because he walked with Father just like Noah did. Okay, just because just because he believed in his father, just like Abram did. Now he's walking in perfection because his spirit man is 100% in control. Once we get to a place where our spirit man is 100% in control, then we'll be able to walk with God and our flesh will be in tune with what our spirit man is doing or it's under suggestion, meaning it has to follow what the spirit is doing. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Uh, a perfect example I have of this is, is your clothes. Think about think about your clothes. Uh, um, some of you, you iron your clothes the night before that you're going to wear to work or wear to church or whatever the next day and you, you lay your clothes out. God gave me this example one day when um, we were living, we had just moved to California. We lived in a little town called King City, and and I had just got my uniform pressed in the military. In the military, we, we make it heavy starch, and it was really pressed like like cardboard, if you will. And uh, I remember laying my pants on a chair and laying the top on the top of the chair to where, when you looked at it, it looked like a body, okay? Because uh, it was really starched and it was really stiff. Uh, we want those creases to show in that military uniform. So Kai, our dog, we had just got him. He, only, he was only a few months old. And he came in the room, and he looked over, and he seen that uniform stretched out, the arms out, the legs stiff, and everything stiff. And he just started barking, barking, barking. I'm like, what's wrong with him? He's barking, 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 barking. Because to him, when he seen that clothes land that way, it looked like a person. So he's just barking, like, you know, barking, barking. He said he had, he had seen me in that uniform before. So now this, now he see me over here, but he see that uniform over there. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Uh, the, the dog is barking because normally when he see that uniform, it, it's on me. But in this case, the uniform is over there and, and I'm over here. And he's barking at this uniform because it looks to him as like another person, or it's not where it normally is. It's normally on me. Uh, so that's what, how it is in the spiritual realm. In the spiritual realm, you are a spirit being, okay? And you are clothed in a body, or you are clothed in a flesh, in flesh, okay? Now, when I put that uniform on, now, when that uniform is sitting there, all it can do is just sit there. But once I put the uniform on, the uniform took shape based on the movements that I'm doing. So picture me, my body, picture me as being the flesh, I mean, excuse me, the, the spirit, and picture the uniform being the flesh, okay? Well, when I put it on, the uniform is going to do what the spirit is doing or what I'm doing, if you will. So if I want the right arm of the uniform to be lifted, I had to lift my arm and then the uniform arm would lift too. If I wanted to put it down, then I'd have to pull my arm and the uniform arm would come down. If I wanted to lift the left leg of the uniform, I had to lift my leg. And when I lift my leg, then the uniform lift. So that's how it is in the spirit. Once your spirit is in control and we have a relationship with God and we're in tune with God, then even though no good thing comes from the flesh, it has to do right thing. So if I want my uniform to put praying hands together and come together, all I need is for my spirit man to do it. So when my spirit man is in charge, then the flesh has to do what the spirit man is saying. And when we are high in the spirit, we are connected with God, we understand this concept. But if something happens and we don't spend much time with God and, and we start to falter and we start to do a few things that's not like God, well, then we take on the mindset that now we're not that perfect being anymore. You're still a perfect being because your perfection is because of who you are. Your perfection is because you are a spirit being from or in the oneness with the spirit of God. Your perfection doesn't come from the body that you're in. Your perfection comes because you're a spirit man that's in oneness with God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. That's why you're perfect. So any sin that you're committing, 
That's not determining unless you've never been saved. Now, if you've never been saved, that's a different story. Okay, That means you haven't given your life to Christ and you are a sinner. But if you saved, your perfection or the perfectness in you, perfection is not because of what you do or don't do. See, that's where the enemy has tricked us all these years. Okay, we, if, if, so if, we, if we're doing everything right, we're praying three times a day, we're doing all these things that we call spiritual, we feel spiritual because of what we're doing. You shouldn't ever feel spiritual because of what you're doing. You are spiritual because you are. You are spiritual because you are a spirit being. You was created that way. Your spirit being. Uh, when 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 uh, when God formed Adam, the Bible says He formed him out of dirt. He made man. He made the flesh. He made the body out of dirt. And then once He finished and took His hands off the dirt, the body just sit there. The body is nothing. Matter of fact, if God hadn't have done what he did next, the dirt, the dirt would have just dwindled back into the form in which it was. Because God formed it in the shape of a man. But it wasn't until he blew into the nostrils of that man made out of dirt that it became a living soul. It wasn't until God blew himself in it. That's when I tell you that you're not a chip off the old block. You, 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 you are actually, ooh, well, here we go. You are actually <laughs> God. Okay. Word made perfect. Lord made perfect. You may need it as somebody right now cringing. I'm trying to tell you that dirt was nothing until God blew himself in it. He didn't blow anything else. Now, if God had have took something and put it inside a man, then you can agree with what the world says and, 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 and disagree with what I'm saying. If, if the Bible says that God took something and put it inside, then you can say, okay, well, God took something and created that living soul. But God didn't take something from somewhere else to finish off Adam. The Bible says he blew into his nostrils. And when he blew into his nostrils, that's when he became a living soul. He blew himself. For those of you that it's hard for you to comprehend that you are God. Because most people in this say, and, and the enemy just tried to get me to say it, that you're God-like. <laughs> you ain't really like God. Okay? You, you, you are him. Because he blew directly into you. Meaning, what was in God is what is what went exactly into you. He didn't mix it with nothing. He didn't use the artificial flavoring. He didn't do any of that. He blew himself. So if he blew himself, the Bible says that God is a spirit. They, they, they worship him. must worship his spirit in truth. If God is a spirit, he blew spirit right on the inside of him. So what is, so is the spirit he blew on the inside of him different than his spirit? He blew himself. He blew himself inside of man. That's why we are perfect. When God was forming man out of the dirt, imperfect. Imperfect. That's why you don't really. <laughs> the enemy been wanting you to think so bad that you're bad. When God was forming this dirt, he was forming, he was forming imperfection. But he blew perfection in. He blew life in. He blew perfection in. He blew power in. He blew authority in. He blew it in. And that's why when it's time to go home to be with the Lord, 
That's why the body get left in the casket. The, that body has no place in heaven. It didn't even come from heaven. You remember I told you in the series before, we are talking about, what am I? We all started out in heaven, just like God did. Just like Jesus did, excuse me. Jesus started out in heaven. You and I started out in heaven. We was created from the foundations of the world. But then God placed Jesus in the womb of Mary, and he was born to take back the authority that we have given away. We all started from there. We all started from heaven. We have to remember that we came from perfection. Hallelujah. We came from perfection. Well, 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 well I know somebody right now who, who, who want to fight this word. Uh, well, God blew into Adam. And then from Adam, he pulled from the side and created Eve. So whatever God initiates, when he pulls from it, it still has it. You and I are spirit beings because that's the way God created man. But your perfection comes from being a spirit being from him. That's where your perfection comes from. So when somebody talking about perfection, okay, don't look at my outside. My outside was formed from the dirt. My body, it came from the dirt. God created that as a dirt man. But my spirit didn't come from the dirt. My spirit didn't come from anything on planet Earth or any other universe. My spirit man came from the one who created me and blew right into his nostrils. Perfection. So God used Jesus as a sacrifice and accepted it because he was without blemish. So now since man had fallen, if you accept Jesus, you inherit. Thank you, that's the word. When you accept Jesus, you inherit something. Okay? If somebody leaves you something in a will, okay, the will says it's yours. If what? You accept it. See, you don't have to accept anything that somebody gives you in the will. Hello, let me, let me explain that again. You don't have to accept anything that somebody gives you in the will. Just because somebody leave your name in the will and say, I'm going to leave you this, I'm going to leave you this brand new car. Or brand, leave you this car. Okay? You don't have to accept it. Even though it was an inheritance, even though it was left for you, you don't have to accept it. Okay. Holy Spirit said, with that being said, that's the same thing with salvation. You don't need to be getting upset if someone don't accept salvation. Accepting salvation or accepting spiritual inheritance is a choice. Just like accepting the car. They don't have to. <laughs> they don't have to, church. Now, you and I know there's not a good thing not to accept, because there is consequences either way. Oh, can I take my time here for my second brother Michael? Can I take my time here? Because there is consequences and circumstances to choosing or not choosing the car or to choosing and not choosing Jesus. We'll start with the car first. If somebody leave you an inheritance, they leave you a car. A lot of people get excited when people leave them stuff. Ooh, my daddy, my mama, my grandma, somebody left me something. Somebody left me a car. Okay? Well, if you have a choice, I can say, nah, I don't want to accept it. And then go back and, and, and the state will take care of it. They can't give it to anybody else because the person who owned it said they wanted you to have it. And you said you didn't want it or you didn't want to accept it. So they take care of it, and you don't have it. But there's a consequence. Well, now, now you just missed out on another opportunity. That could have been your first car, or that could have been your extra car. But because you didn't accept it, okay, you, 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 don't, you, you lose the responsibility 
of taking care of the car because accepting the car has responsibilities. So I lose out if I don't take it, but if I do take it, I got responsibilities. I got to keep it up, maintenance on it. I got to keep it maintained. I got to keep it washed. I got to, you know what I'm saying? I got to keep the tires and all that type of stuff. I got responsibility. Well, same thing with Jesus. Jesus gave you an inheritance, which is eternal life. And, 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 and it comes with consequences. If you don't accept it, that means you're still holding your sins. That means you're going to die with your sins. And anybody who dies with their own sins, there's a place that you're going to go to called hell or Hades that's not heaven. Because that means on judgment day, you're still holding what you was born with. The Bible said you was born in iniquity and you're still holding it. See, the, 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 the key is not to be holding the iniquity, iniquity that you was born with. You must give it over to Jesus. You must exchange your iniquity for his salvation. Okay? You must be, it must be an exchange. And you exchange by accepting him. When you accept Jesus, you hand him your iniquity, he hands you his salvation. So on judgment day, or if you pass away, or pass away before judgment day, but whenever your day comes, or judgment day, whichever is first, when Jesus see you, people done taught you that if you got all this sin in your life, but no, you've been saved. You, you had an exchange. So no matter what your flesh done, there's a grace that says, I made an exchange. So uh, it's kind of like a ticket. It's kind of like a pass. It's like if you got the pass, you can come in. If you got the ticket, you can come in. It's two tickets. It's a ticket of iniquity and a ticket of salvation. And at some point in your life, you have to make an exchange. You have to make an exchange. And when you make an exchange... Okay, you gave God iniquity. Well, you gave your, your iniquity over to Jesus. But Jesus gave you salvation, which in the Greek and the Hebrew comes, which means uh, soteria and sozo. Those two words mean the whole pie. He gave you salvation. He gave you healing. He gave you deliverance. He gave you all of this in this pie in his ticket. It wasn't just a ticket to go to heaven. You gave them iniquity, and he gave you salvation. Which now forms who you are. Which now forms who you are. You are a spirit being. And we covered all that in the what. And go back and look at that series. But who you are and whose you are. You now have accepted Jesus. Hallelujah. I don't know about you. But when you accepted Jesus. Mm, the heavens. The kingdom opened up for you. And God views the sacrifice that Jesus made as no blemish. This is what I want to make sure I get to before I move on. God has accepted, and that's the first thing. That's the first thing, church. If G This is why everybody must love Jesus. I'm going to tell you why everybody must love Jesus. Jesus had to execute to the point that God would accept Do y'all follow me? Jesus had to execute God's plan. Believe God by faith. Trust him. Walk with him. Lay down his life on the cross. Go to hell for three days on our behalf. Raise God. Raise him from the dead on the third day with all power in his hand. And then God accepted all of that as non-blemish or no blemish. So now when <laughs> thank you, Spirit, when Jesus is exchanging with you, you giving him iniquity, he's giving you I called it salvation, explained it what it was, but maybe this will help you out as it relates to perfection. He's exchanging no blemish. Maybe this is why you can't see yourself as perfect. Maybe nobody explains salvation Another name for it is no blemish. So you gave God iniquity. He exchanged and gave you no blemish. A no blemish salvation. A perfect salvation. 
Now let's take the acceptance a little bit further because I think God got us on a roll here and I want everybody to understand this. Let's say, I, it's going back to our car analogy. Let's say I decide to accept the inheritance. My family member left me the car. Okay? The family member left me the car. And when that family member left me the car, I took it home, parked it in the garage, and never touched it. I have the responsibility of that car because it was given to me. But instead of using it for it to be helpful in my life, I came home and parked it. That's what people have done, Christians have done, with the no blemish salvation exchange. You gave Jesus your iniquity. He gave you salvation, sozo, soteria. He gave you perfection. He gave you all kinds of stuff. All kinds of stuff are tied up into what he gave you. And we took his salvation, and it was a big old pie. A picture of a big old pizza, and it had slices here. Remember, I tell you, deliverance, healing, prosperity, all these things is in this in this pie. All these things are in this pie that makes up who you are. Okay? All these things, because now you used to be a sinner. So you handed iniquity over. So the title of sinner got passed over to Jesus. And I'll tell you what he did with it later. But then he handed you salvation. And you accepted it. So when you accepted it, you became a child of God. You became uh, uh, the ability to become sons of God. I mean, operating his authority. Uh, he, you, you had the ability to, to prosper, to be healed, delivered, set free. All of this stuff, anointed, all of this stuff came inside this package. But what Christians have done, they looked at this pie with all these slices and did this. I just want this one. This is, the, this is the piece of pie that says, I'm saved. This is the one I want. I'm on my way to heaven now. I, I want this piece. And what you did with the rest of the pie was put it in the oven and let it sit. So you're walking around with this one slice. And the thing about it is, you believe that slice. Every Christian that I've met, if I ask them, are they on, are they going to heaven? With a shadow of a doubt, they say yes. Because they believe that they received freedom and were saved when they got the pie. They believe it. But took the rest of it and put it in the oven. So they're walking around with their partial salvation. See, we've called it salvation so long that that became the definition of salvation, being saved. No, that's a piece of the pie. So we've been walking around with partial salvation, meaning believing only a part of it is what I mean. We've been walking around with the part that's going to bring us to heaven and then tried to self-will prayer to be healed, delivered, self self uh, Self-will, we have tried to become prosperous and do all these things. We've tried to do it. We did it in self-effort. That's what I'm looking for. In self-effort. When really, it was already a part of the pie. The same way you believed in the salvation part, um, you should have believed in the prosperity. You should have believed in the healing. You should have believed in the deliverance. All of that was in the pie. All of that was in the pie. So when you don't use or operate with the rest of the pie, or believe that when Jesus gave you salvation and all of this entangled with it, it's going to be hard for you to believe perfection. Because you're going to be living a lie, I'm stupid, you're going to be living a life that only pertains to being saved. You haven't put the other slices of the pie into operation. So you're going to feel like lack. There's going to be times where you're going to feel like you have lack in your life. There's going to be times where Spiritually, uh, emotionally, 
You're going to be affected mentally. You're going to be affected uh, because you're not walking in this, the glory that was, you're supposed to be walking in. You're walking in a portion of it. And, and you're walking in a portion. Thank you, Holy Spirit. You're walking in a portion that takes effect when you die. So the whole pie, the whole pie pertains to you, but you only believe in the part that happens on the day you die, the going to heaven part. So the part of the pie, which is the rest of the pie, that pertain to how you should live and how we should operate here, that part of the pie is an oven. I dare say a Christian today to go over to the oven and take the rest of the pie out. Take the rest of the pizza out and start operating. Well, how do I operate at all those other levels, Pastor? Easy. You operate in the other slices of the pie the same way you operated in the first part, piece of the pie, which is believing that you say. If you can say, I'm going to heaven today and I know it, you should be saying, I'm healed today and I know it. I'm set free today and I know it. I'm walking in prosperity today and I know it. I'm blessed today and I know it. I'm, I'm operating in God's anointing today, and I, and I know it. The same response that you had with the first slice is the same response you should have with the other slices. I can't even put a number on other slices. Ago. It's so many slices that God left you with. The exchange that you and Jesus had, had so many. And then I'll tell you later, I'll tell you what he did with it. The Bible says that he said that he, your sins are, are removed from you as far as the east is from the west, and he threw your sins in the sea of forgetfulness. That's where it went. Never to bound you or haunt you again. So when you see past sins that you used to do trying to come up in your in your life after you have made this exchange with Jesus. We shouldn't be accepting those. They've already been removed as far as the east is from the west. I want you to know the east and the west never meets up. <laughs> I know. You think about east and west because you're in the United States, and you think, if I go east and somebody goes west, we'll meet on the other side of the globe. Maybe that's been your confusion all of you. That ain't God's east from the west. He ain't talking about around earth. He says, your sins is as far east and as far west in those directions. They never meet up ever again. So the enemy trying to bring back things of your life that you used to do back in the day, they should never meet up. Your sins have been removed from you as far as the east is from the west. This makes up you are. This makes up who you are. Hallelujah. Now let me drop down to our main verse for today as we continue to read. Verse number 4, Psalms 139, verse number 4, it says, For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it altogether. God knows all about you. There's nothing on the inside of you that God doesn't know. There's nothing on your tongue that God doesn't know. God doesn't wait until you say it for him to know it. He already knew it before you, before you said it. He knew, he knew it from the foundation of the world. Thou hast beset me behind and before and laid thy hand upon me. He's before you. He's behind you. He's all around you. He says, such knowledge, verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. Now listen, you need to know this. No man in the flesh can understand the spirit realm. Let me say that again. There is no man in the flesh, meaning operating by the flesh, thinking by the flesh. There is no man in the flesh that can understand the spirit. It is too high for them. Everything that you know about God, maybe this is going to help some religious folks. Everything that you know about God was revealed to you. And when we stop trying to become close to God to a point where he's revealing to us, when you stop listening to God's revelation knowledge, 
your, your growth in God is stunted. Let me say it again. When you stop of trying to obtain the spiritual revelation of God's word, then you're going to stop growing. And this is what happened to a lot of my religious brothers and sisters. You're saved and you're on your way to heaven and I'll see you there. But if you stop receiving revelation knowledge from God, then your growth is going to be stunned. That's why when I talk about being perfect, it bothers you. It bothers you because you have stopped learning revelation knowledge from God and you now you are relying on, we talked about this in the military this week, tacit knowledge, things that I got from experience or what I've done in my past. That's a tacit knowledge. And then there is an explicit knowledge. Explicit knowledge is like doctrine and you know manuals and all the things that tell you how to do something. Like you open up your car and you get the manual out. That would be a doctrine. It's everything in that book is true about your car. It's the doctrine of your car. But then your tacit knowledge is stuff that you've experienced. And when you've experienced things, okay, it's going to stunt your growth. Or you would never want to find out the true meaning of why God said this or why God, God called you perfect. He called you perfect because the word made you perfect. You've been made perfect by the word. Hallelujah. But if you don't know that, it's such a growth. And a lot of religious folk, you can't get any higher in God. Matter of fact, if you listen to yourself over the last 20 years, you have talked about the same thing. You know why? Because you're at a level you can't get any higher because to go any higher, you would need revelation knowledge. That's why the man of God right here is saying such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. And another thing about knowledge, a word being uh, such knowledge is being too wonderful. Grace. That's why people don't really understand the meaning of grace, because grace is so sufficient in every area of our life. It's, in our mind, it's like, that's just too good to be true. It's just too wonderful. It's too wonderful to be, knowing that grace covers me, grace got me covered. You know what I'm saying? It's hard for people to, you were saved by grace. Grace already been in operation when you made the exchange. But it's too wonderful for you because it's too high for you because you are not allowing God to elevate you through the word. You're not letting the word make you operate in that perfection. Hallelujah. Verse number seven said, whether I, whether shall I go from thy spirit or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If thou make thy if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. See, this is a part of your who you are. You are a spirit being that is in control or being led by the spirit of God. And no matter where you go, it don't matter where you go. Well, let me break this down because I know we've read this plenty of times before, but let me say it like this so it'll come home to you. He says, if I send them into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take up wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, you are there. And even there shall thy hand lead me. Okay, let me explain that. He said, if I ascend into heaven, we know that's the most glorious place there is to be in the kingdom, in the presence of God. If, if I went there, he's there. Or if you made your bed in hell, he's going to be there. Because God is omnipresent. He's everywhere. So even if you make your bed in hell, even if you don't accept Jesus, you'll see him. You'll see God because he'll be there. Now, Let's put it in natural form. Let's say even before you were saved and you was out in the world and out in the club and all the different places. See, he just said heaven and he just said hell and everywhere in between. So any place that you've ever been that's not and, and, and was not even glorifying God there, he was there with you. He said, never leave you nor forsake you. So, so God is everywhere. Hallelujah. This is a part of your who. This is a part of your chemical makeup that you got 
the almighty God in your presence all the time. So we've always looked at that separate, like I'm me and God is in my presence. No, no. God's presence and my spiritual presence are they're together. It's oneness. <laughs> it ain't, oh, I, I want to be in God's presence. Well, when you in yourself, meaning when you operate from your spiritual man, you in God's presence because it's a oneness. It ain't like <laughs> now it makes sense why at first it makes sense because I always thought, well, God don't like sinners, so why? So evidently, when he when I was young, when he's when he's uh when, when I'm doing bad, God is not around, and then when I'm doing good, he's around. No, that ain't how it is. God said he would never leave you nor forsake you. You know why? Because he can't. Ooh, we're made perfect. I know it's hard. I know it's hard to believe. He can't leave you. If your spirit being this oneness of him, how can he leave you? In order for him to leave you, he had to leave himself. So when somebody tells you when you're doing something wrong and God doesn't turn his back on you, that's a lie. He can't. How? How can he leave his own spirit? He would never leave you nor forsake you because he can't. That's why even for people that's going to hell, they're going to see him. <laughs> he just said, if, you, if you're sitting in heaven or if you go to hell, I'm still going to be there. Okay. I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Because uh, you don't have to believe that to believe the next thing I'm getting ready to read. Verse number 10 says, even there... Verse number 10, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Mm. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both a light to me. Anybody understand what that means? Let me break this down before we get ready to get out of here today. It says, verse number 10, even there shall thy hand lead me. We're talking about all these places that he just mentioned. Whether I'm in heaven, whether I'm in hell, whether I'm from the wings of the morning and been in the utmost parts of the sea. He's talking about all these places and anywhere in between. At the club, everywhere. Okay? Everywhere. Okay? When God says heaven and then he mentioned hell, he wants you to know that I'm talking about everything in between. When God says I'm the Alpha and the Omega, He's talking about everything in between. He says, even there shall my hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. Even when you're down in the club and the shots rang and, and all that stuff happened and the fight broke out and somebody broke out with a knife and broke, somebody broke out with a gun, but you were able to get home safe, he was holding you. Verse 11, if I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. He says, even, this is what this means. Even if, and, and we, I, I've been there before, maybe I'm just preaching to myself today. There was a time when I knew about God and I was hiding from him. One I like to share a lot when my Aunt Minnie used to come. Um, my Aunt Minnie, she, she was saved. And Aunt Minnie, we could see her coming down to Grandmama's house. And we see her, she coming to the front door, we leaving at the back. We was trying to hide from the light. We were trying to get back to darkness because we, we knew she was going to come in talking the Bible. God says, even when you try to even when you try to hang out in darkness to stay away from the light, I'm over there in the dark with you. <laughs> Have you ever been in the middle of doing something bad and you were like, and then you feel the presence of God on you and God begin to speak to you and you're like, right in the middle of darkness? Because there's no hiding. God is trying to say, you can go and stay in the darkness all you want. That's why when I pray for somebody or somebody come to church, they get saved, and then all of a sudden I hear they back out in the world again, that never bothers me. That's never bothered me. The reason why, because I understand, you can go back over to darkness. The light is just going to follow you over there. And I'm saying follow so you'll understand, but you're really carrying the light over there because you're flesh, you're a spirit being. But the light is going to be over there with you. You can't run. So you'll be in a dark place and God will be speaking to you. I remember that so vividly. I remember right before 
I really buckled down and said, I got the following the Lord. And this was back when I was about 25, 26 years old. Uh, it was right before I got married and it was right before you know, God was dealing with me. And, and, and I remember trying to do bad things again. Woo! I remember trying to, trying to hang out with friends again. Couldn't do it. I, I mean, I'm there and, and, and I'm drinking, I'm drinking something and getting no buzz. Okay. Let me be honest with y'all today. Cause I don't know if y'all ready for this. When God made up his mind that, son, I'm going to move you this way, even though I tried to go and stay away over into darkness, the things that I did in the dark didn't even have the effect that they had before I got saved. I could drink two drinks and it felt like I drank two glasses of water. So now I got to sit around and act like I'm having fun. Oh, my gosh. I got to sit around and act like I'm having fun because God... Well, 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 how can God do that? Well, well, do uh, you remember uh, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? You remember when God put them in the fiery furnace? You remember other men got snagged into the fiery furnace and burnt up. But when God put them in there, he took away the heat. God didn't take away the flame. He didn't take away the furnace. They were in the same furnace that the other men had went in, got drawn in, but God took away the heat. God took away what was dangerous. The flame ain't dangerous. It's the heat of the flame that's dangerous. So when he went, when they went in, and when people looked in, they saw the flames, they saw them, and they said there's a fourth man in, looks like the Son of God, because they all walk around in flames with no heat. The flames ain't your problem. It's the heat that's the problem. God took away the heat. But the Bible said that when it came out, the clothes weren't even singed. But the only thing that burned over them was what? The, the ropes, the things that was binding them. Everything that had them bound was burnt off. <laughs> but their clothes said it wasn't even singed. How can your clothes not be singed or burned, but but your handcuffs is was was burnt off? Because God knows when he runs you through that fire and you go down through that dark road and you think you're running from God, you think that you're in, you know, you in darkness and you think that it's fine, God goes down in there and deals with the issue on the inside, the real issue, or the real bondage. Ooh, man. I'm talking about who you, who you are today. Who am I? You want to know who you are? You are an individual that God will follow to the end of the earth. He started you from the foundation of the earth. And he's going to follow you to the end of the earth. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's who you are. They said, verse 12, Lightness, <clears throat> the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. You down in darkness, and the light is popping up. Matter of fact, thank you, Holy Spirit. I remember when I used to try to hang out with my friends down in darkness. When I used to try to go and hang down in darkness and try to run from the light, they didn't even want me around. I blew they high because they could still see the light in me. Although I'm trying to run to the darkness, you can't cast away the light that's on the inside of you. They really didn't have any fun when I'm around. So what started happening is they started doing things to make sure that I wasn't there. Because your light would show up in darkness at all. Oh, oh boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Verse number 12. One more time, then we move on. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both a light to thee. Verse 13. For thou hast possessed my reins. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. Many from the beginning, God's been there. But this is what I want you to see, because this is going to tell you or show you who you are. The title of the sermon is, Who Am I? Okay? I will praise thee. You ought to be thankful for everything that God has shared with you today. That you operate as you his part of his spirit. You're connected in one with his spirit. You operate by grace. You have the ability to operate in rest. Everything that God has shared with you do, you should be saying right now, I will praise thee. And then you ought to have enough faith right now, based because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that word made perfect, going to help you out. It says, I will praise thee, for I am fearfully 
and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and, and thou my soul knoweth right well. That is the definition of who you are. That is the definition of who you are. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works. And that my soul knoweth right well. Do you believe that you are fearfully and wonderfully made today? Do you believe that you're made perfect by the word today? Do you believe that your works or what God has blessed your hands to do or your mouth to do? Do you believe that it's wonderful? Do you know that your soul knoweth right well? When I was down in darkness trying to hang out after being saved, when I tried to go down in darkness after being saved, what was right in me, which is the spirit, always came up. Always came up. When you're operating at this level, you will know right well. See, that's why when you're talking to somebody and trying to bring them back to Christ, when you're talking to somebody and trying to bring them back to Christ, you don't need to convict them. You don't need to uh, condemn, condemn them. The word will convict. It doesn't condemn. It convicts, but it doesn't condemn. You don't need to convict or condemn them. The word will convict them. Because they already know right well. They are fearfully and wonderfully made. Their works are marvelous. And they know right well down in their soul. That's why you don't have to come with condemnation. The Bible says there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no condemnation for somebody who's been saved. There is no condemnation for someone who got saved and went back out into the world. And I told you I don't have to worry about them. They carry the light with them. God sometimes uses people to talk to us about God and get us on track. Sometimes, and, but a lot of times he don't need that. A lot of times he, when he, when I was down in that darkness, he was talking to me from the inside. I'm sitting around and watching the guys drinking and smoking and everything. I'm watching it. It's like he was just telling me he was he was talk, he was bringing up that right spirit on the inside, right in the midst. I remember one day I was drinking a beer and God started dealing with me and I was about halfway through. He's like, you're spending your time. You're not going to get any feeling from that. None of this stuff is going to affect you. You are mine. It ain't just who you are, but it's whose you are. And I remember I said, well, you know, I'm just going to just chill out and just kind of just hang out. So I'm just sitting there just hanging out and not really saying anything, just, just sitting there. But the light starting to shine. And somebody got on me for leaving my beer there. That beer been there about an hour. He ain't dropping half of it. I was, really thought I was fitting in and nobody noticed. What I'm trying to say is that light is going to always show up. No matter where you are, church. And the reason why is because of who you are. The way you were made. It, you are made to always shine. Even in darkness. And even when we try to try to run from God, the light comes down in the dark area and does its work. The light can work anywhere. Do you know that Jesus saved souls in hell when he went for those three days? <laughs> See, they didn't get a chance to know Jesus. He wasn't here yet in the physical realm. I'm trying to tell you the light can go anywhere and perform. The light can go anywhere and execute. Hallelujah. I'm going to read it one more time before we go. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. There may be someone here today after hearing this word that God touched your heart, and today you want to give your life to Christ. I want you to know it's not a game. It's not a gimmick. 
If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead, you shall be saved. Or maybe someone here today after hearing this word, you want to rededicate your life back to him. Be like, Pastor, I'm saved, but I've just not been living the life that God wants me to, and I want to, I want to reconnect with God. I want you to know that he said that he would never leave and forsake you. He said, if you return unto me, I shall return unto you. And maybe someone here today after hearing this word, that God says, this is your church home. And this is where he wants to plant you. He wants to put you in a place where you can hear the word and grow. Hallelujah. And he has a mission for you. And this is the place where he wants you to execute it. Hallelujah. If that's you, we offer Christ to you. And then last but not least, we're going to pray for the people. The Bible says we all stand in the need of prayer. So first, if you want to be saved today, hallelujah, if you want to be saved today, uh, repeat this prayer of salvation after me. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, but I confess and believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and rose from the grave or from hell on the third day with all power in his hand. And because I confess and because I believe, I believe I'm saved, I'm saved, I'm saved. Hallelujah. If you pray that prayer, God just saved you. We want you to reach out to us at Greater Mission Ministries Church at gmail.com and tell us about your experience. There may be someone here today you want to rededicate your life. You're saying, Pastor, I need to return back to the Lord. Repeat this prayer of rededication with me. Dear Lord, forgive me for my sins. Come into my heart, create in me a clean heart, and renew a right spirit within me. Lord, this time I promise it'll be much better than before. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. If you pray that prayer, I want you to know that God just received you. Hallelujah. He accepted and given you the forgiveness. Hallelujah. If you want to reach out to us today, and God told you this is your church home, reach out to us at Greater Mission Ministries Church at gmail.com or reach out to me personally at Pastor Michael T. Weeks, W-E-A-K-S, at gmail.com. And we'll get back to you. We want to send some stuff to you and let you know that we love you and send you a ministry gift. I just want you to know that God is truly, has truly watched over your life. Hallelujah. And he's brought you to this place hallelujah, where we can work and do his will. Hallelujah. Now let's pray for the body before we go into our Holy Communion. Father, we thank you. We bless you right now for your people, God. We thank you now for your word. Father, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy, God. You are so wonderful. You're so magnificent. And we just thank you here today. Father, we pray now a special word over your people, an anointed word. First of all, give them a double portion of your anointing, God, which removes every burden and destroys every yoke. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that you would bring, lift them to that place, God. Give them the knowledge to realize that they've been made perfect by the word. And because that they are another speaking spirit, they have the ability to create just like you in Genesis. Father, I thank you right now for your people. I thank you now for the word. I thank you for the blood that was shed by the precious lamb. And we just thank you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. We're going to give you about a minute or so to prepare. Hopefully you've all time had prepared for um, Holy Communion. So we're going to take about a minute and we'll be back.
Hallelujah. Glory to your name. Glory to your name. We're going to prepare for Holy Communion. If you have your Bible, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 through 30. And it reads, for I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood, this this do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and also let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. Let us pray. Father, we thank you right now for this sacred time, God, when we come before you and partake in the body and the blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. First of all, God, we say thank you for forgiveness today. Forgive us for all of our sins, God, as we prepare ourselves to commune with you. Father, I pray that by the communing of this union, God, that you would use it to elevate us in our spiritual realm, God, that you begin to talk to us and to speak to us and to share with us on another level, God, that we may be able to receive the high knowledge that you have called for us to have. We thank you on this day. In Jesus' name, amen. And first, they took the bread, which represents the body of Jesus Christ, and they broke it and eat. Also, the cup, which represents or signifies the blood of the Lamb. Take and drink. First of all, I want to just thank you all for being a part of the service today. I want to thank you for uh, the offerings that continue to flow into the ministry. It's a blessing that you keep honoring God through in and through your giving. I'm going to pray for your offering right now. Father, we just thank you right now for uh, the seed that you're placed in our, in our hands. We don't count it as debt we owe, but seeds that we sow unto the kingdom. So, Father, take our seed, use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Uh, just want to thank you all for being great stewards of the ministry. It was such a blessing to come out to California this week and see many of you, and I missed a few of you, but we know that God is still on the throne. Prayers are still going up on your behalf. We love you here at Greater Mission Ministries, and we're going to get through this. Hallelujah. We're going to get through this pandemic. I want you to know to be continue to be safe. We want to follow the guidelines of the CDC and, and the things that are being put out by our scientists um, that do a lot of study in this area. However, continue to be safe and continue to do the things that you do, need to do that keeps you safe. Uh, if you feel you need to continue to wear a mask in certain places, you do so. Uh, I want you to know that just remember that you and I are in God's hands, and God has us, but he does want us to operate by wisdom. Hallelujah. By wisdom and by faith. So we thank you today. I want to give a shout out to my son, Micah. Today is his birthday. He turned 19 today. Uh, so blessed to have him in my life. He's such a great son, uh, son that's not given me problems over the years, 
a son that's striving to better himself all the time. I just thank God for him. And I'm also thankful for all of my children. Uh, Chris is doing such wonderful things in the kingdom. And Naya will be graduating from Pepperdine University uh, this upcoming year. She'll be a senior. And then my son Darius, he's out there working with his, for his family and, and doing what he needs to do. And I just thank God for all of them. All of them are good kids and sweet kids in their own way. And I just thank God for them. But once again, just want to bless Michael today. Uh, today is his birthday. He turned 19 years old. Hallelujah. So until next time, Greater Mission Ministries, family and friends, we will see you down the road and just understand that God still loves you and so do we. Be blessed in the name of the Lord.